Let hope rise. And we're going to be reading right now about some people whose lives felt hopeless. And that were the, the disciples and the followers of Jesus who just thought Jesus had died and that was the end of the story until the Sunday morning. So I want you to turn to the inside and we're going to read from Matthew's account, everybody. And verse five says this. Then the angel said to the women, I mean, look at this, everyone, an angel. How often you meet an angel? My wife married one, but um, <laughs> no, don't believe that. Don't believe that. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. And here's the good news. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, I love the gospel account because the angels are saying, you women are the most important. You women who are full of faith, you're going to tell the guys, go and tell the men what has happened. He says, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. We are talking about hope. And this is what we're going to be talking about. Hope rises when, write this in for number one. Hope rises when I understand grace is available to everyone. We're going to be dipping into Ephesians chapter two. The book of Ephesians is a book all about hope. And it says there, for it is by grace, and grace is not just a girl's name or something we say before dinner or breakfast, but grace you have, uh, by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself, it is what? It is the gift of God. Grace is a gift. I've got some really cool friends here in America, and they're very smart because they love Ireland, okay? They love Ireland. That is God's will for your life, that you would all love Ireland, okay? It's the center of the universe, everyone, okay? It's been historically proved that the Garden of Eden was just outside Dublin. That's where it all started. And, uh, and so they love Ireland, and recently uh, she got to go on a trip back to see some friends. He couldn't go, and his wife went over to Ireland, and on a Sunday afternoon, she called him and said, hey, I'm in this like bar restaurant in Dublin, and you will never guess who's just sitting across from me having lunch with some of his friends. And he said, I don't know, who is it? Like, is it Bono? Is it Bono? She said, no, it's, you all know Bono? Yeah. He'll be leading worship in heaven, everybody, with Lincoln. And, uh, and she said, no, no, it's, it's, it's not Bono. It's even bigger than that. And he's going, well, who is it? And she said, it's Conor McGregor. <laughs> and uh, maybe you've never heard of him because he's a very quiet, timid, uh, very, very quiet Irishman. And, uh, and it was Conor McGregor. And so he said to her, well, I'll tell you what, get our visa card and pay for his lunch, the whole table. I just want to blow him away. So she gave to the waiter her visa card. And uh, a couple of minutes later, she felt someone stand behind her, thought it was the waiter, was going to sign for the check and turned around. It was Conor McGregor. And he was holding her visa card. And he said to her, thank you so much for the kind gesture of wanting to buy my lunch, but you can't do that here. And she said, why not? He said, because I own the place. I own the place. Look at me, everybody. God owns the place. He owns everything. That's what the cross is about. The cross is the moment where Jesus paid for everything and you can't pay for it. And you're trying to work your way up to be a better person and God says, no, the price has already been paid. You don't need to cover it. It was covered on the cross because on that cross, God came to pay for our sin, but he also came as a man to identify with us. I read recently about one incredible dad. His name is Josh Marshall. He's 28 years old. He lives in Kansas. And his son had undergone brain surgery because he had a cancerous tumor in his head. And you can only imagine the trauma that they went through. And they were connected to a children's charity that helps with cancer survivors. And every year they have an annual competition and it's called Best Bald Dad. And it's not just for bald dads, it's for dads that are gonna say, you know what, son or daughter, you're losing your hair through the treatment and I'm gonna shave mine off just to stand with you. Well, Josh, he won it because he went one step further. Look at this, look at his beautiful son here, everyone. There's the scar from the surgery, but not only did dad, Josh, shave his head, he got a tattoo of his son's scar put on the side of his head. How incredible is that? It's quite remarkable. And for me, that is an image 
That's an image of the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah, he paid for our sin, but he carries the scars so that he can identify with us because some of us, we're carrying scars in our lives. Some of them literal, but most of them emotional. Some of them, they're self-inflicted because of the junk we did in the past. Others, it was stuff that was done to us. But you know what? You have a father, you have a savior. His name is Jesus and he stands with you and he gets you. And every time I look at the cross and I look at Jesus, I go, he understands me. This grace is available for everyone. So hope rises when I understand the grace is available for everyone. But also hope rises, number two, is that when I experience the resurrection, this is really cool here. This word experience means that you get to experience the resurrection. It's not just a Jesus thing, but he wants you to understand it. So how can you experience the resurrection? Simply everyone, intellectually, spiritually, and physically on three different levels. Let's talk about this intellectually just for a second. The apostle Paul, he was alive at the time of Jesus and he wrote this 25 years after the resurrection. Look what he says. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now let's just pause there because some of you in the room you're going, you know what, Andrew? Uh, I really love the vibe in this place. I like the worship, the guy with the mohawk, and I'm really loving your shirt. And uh, <laughs> I just, you know, the whole thing is like cool, and I like what you're going to do with the inner city and stuff like that. <laughs> but a guy rising from the dead, please, please. Andrew, you're smoking dope long before it was legalized around here. I mean, what, what are you on? And now, and now you're trying to justify that with the scriptures and you're trying to go, this, I mean, who really takes the Bible seriously? In the intellectual world, who takes the Bible seriously? Well, I do and millions of people do because they actually think about it. And I, I would push back on you and go, you need to understand history and the documentation of history. So let's just talk about this. Alexander the Great, Every, everyone heard of Alexander the Great? Okay, the Greek, and uh, he, he brought culture to the world. Quite an amazing young man. Um, has anyone ever thought, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, I don't really believe he ever lived. I'm not sure if he ever lived. Well, just listen to this for one second. The best historical documents that we have proving that Alexander the Great was alive were written 400 years after his death. 400 years. This was written 25 years after the death of Jesus Christ. This is really, really interesting, everyone. This is what a guy, his name is F.F. F. Bruce, and he was the uh, New Testament scholar based at Manchester University. He said, if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. For some of the key historical events that we all believe in, we maybe have one or two copies. With the Bible, we have thousands of them and they are virtually identical. We really should believe this stuff. So Paul said this earlier on, that Jesus was, <laughs> he was dead, everyone, he, he was dead. Not only did the Bible declare that, but a Roman historian by the name of Tacitus, he wrote this in his annals. He said, Christos, or Jesus, suffered the extreme penalty at the hands of Pontius Pilate. So it's recorded in history as well that Jesus really did die. But then some people go as well, well, did he really die? Did he really die? Like when he went into that tomb, was he like semi-comatose? And it was like the, maybe, you know, the essential oils that were in the, any essential oil girls, you know? It was the essential oils, you know? Oh, oh that lavender. Oh, oh, soothing, soothing. And uh, one woman, she, she wrote to a guy called Vernon McGee, and she said, because things have changed and people dilute this. She said, our preacher said that on Easter, Jesus swooned on the cross and that the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? And he replied, he said, uh, well, beat your preacher with a leather whip for 39 strokes, kneel him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him in an earless tomb for three days, and then see what happens. Are you with me, everybody? He really did die. And then he was buried. He, he was buried. Again, this guy is called uh, John Robinson, and he's a New Testament scholar uh, from Cambridge University. He said, the honorable burial of Jesus is one of the earliest and best attested facts that we have about the historical Jesus. So he died, 
He was buried, and this is the most important thing, he was raised. This is so important, everybody. He was raised. Back to that letter that Paul wrote to Corinth. He said he appeared to Peter. That's like his best friend. Your sort of best friend doesn't go, I'm not not sure if that's you. No, no, your best friend knows you, yes. And then to the 12, who he had hung out with for three years. And after that, he appeared to what? To more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. He said, they're alive. If you want to check this out, this is 25 years on. I told this to you years ago, but some of these people, they are still alive. Now, some of them have fallen asleep. They've died, but most of them are alive. Check this out for yourselves. There's like over 500 of them. You mean just scroll through your text? Okay, work with me. Then he appeared to James. Who's James? His half-brother. You can't mess about with your half-brother, everyone. He knew Jesus and he was raised from the dead. And these people who actually met Jesus, listen to me, they died for this belief. It wasn't just, you know, they made this up and then went through the most excruciating forms of death. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. I wouldn't do that for a lie. They had seen the risen Christ, over 500 of them. Let's bring this into a court of law here just for a second. We've got all of these people who testify that Jesus was raised from the dead. Imagine if we brought them in the court of law and we give them 15 minutes each just to be, give their story and be cross-examined, 15 minutes each. This is the truth, everyone. We would start hearing their testimony today. We would be here all day. We would go through the night. We'd be here all day Monday, all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, Thursday. We would finish around Friday lunchtime. It would take 128 hours of testimony to hear all the people that saw Jesus Christ alive. Isn't that incredible, everyone? So it's really important that we grasp this, that we actually believe that we can experience the resurrection on an intellectual basis. Then the next one is this, spiritually. We can experience it spiritually. Back to Ephesians. Ephesians 2 says this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Why did he make us alive? Because what? We were dead in transgressions. Look at me here for a minute. I've got bad news for you. But good news as well. You're dead. And you're there in your Easter glam rags. I saw you all walking in. It was like a fashion show. Oh my goodness. The Loomis latest stuff. It was all being worn. Oh my goodness. You look incredible. But this is what the Bible says. That outside of God... We're dead in our sins. Spiritually, we're dead. Physically, we're alive. But spiritually, we are dead. And God wants us to know a spiritual resurrection. That's what you can experience today. Last Sunday on our campus, we did baptisms. And we had 18 people getting baptized. It was really cool. And we were all celebrating with them. But one guy caught my eye. And it's this guy here. His name is Bill. And Bill is a cool dude. Look at him, everyone. He's a cool dude. He's 86 years old and he got baptized. He is a war veteran from the Korean War, everybody. I mean, this is like the all-American hero. You're not even clapping. You're like, I'm in the scouts. Come on, everyone. And then I got to find out his story. I got talking to him. I got to find out his story. I mean, this guy lived far from God, far from God. I mean, he was godless. And his daughter uh, was a member of Bayside, and she tried to get him to come to Bayside. And this is what he said, I am never going to Bayside. If I go to Bayside, the roof will collapse. I'll get hit by lightning. Some of you are already sitting a bit scared, okay? And he said, that's never going. But his, her, his daughter just kept at him, and she used to leave, you know, Christian books strategically placed around the house, like in the microwave and the fridge, and, you know, <laughs> just, just put them in subtle. Uh, and and he, he wouldn't have it. But then he didn't tell her this. He signed up for what's called the Bayside Refuel Devotions. And, and you can get Refuel Devotions every single day. You get them on Facebook, YouTube, and you subscribe to them. And he, he did this, and he kept watching them. And one day, he heard me give a talk on forgiveness, and he melted. He just melted, because he thought, I need to forgive people, I need to be forgiven by people, and I need to be forgiven by God. He told his daughter about it, he came along to Bayside, and in a service just like this, he said a simple prayer of repentance and gave his life to Jesus at 86 years old, everybody. 86 years old. 
He had a resurrection, everybody. He suddenly came alive and he hasn't missed a Sunday since and he's absolutely committed this. You, you may not be 86 years old. You may not have fought in the Korean War, but look at me. We're all far from God and outside of God, we're dead in our sins. But the moment that you open up your heart to Jesus Christ, spiritually, you come alive and you have a resurrection. And God's spirit comes into you in the most remarkable way. But it's not only intellectually and spiritually, but you know what, it's physically as well. This is the hope of Christianity. One thing we all have in common, we're all gonna die. You glad you came to church today for this encouraging message. <laughs> we're all gonna die, it's 100% guaranteed. It's gonna be different ways, but we are all going to die. Uh, Woody Allen said this and I thought it was so smart. He said, I'm not scared of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. I just wanna be all right, you know? One of the things that I've, you know, uh, got used to in America now that never had it in Ireland uh, in, in terms of wildlife are possums. We don't have any possums in Ireland. I think St. Patrick chased them all out with the snakes and stuff they left at that time. But we got possums. And it seems to be that possums are just treated like a standard roadkill in America. They're just like standard, you got a road, you got a dead possum on it. That's just what, you know, that's just what happens. Uh, and the question goes, why did the chicken cross the road? to prove to the possum that it could be done. You know, you, you can do this, stupid possum. You know, you don't have to, you know, get splatted every time. And so, but possums are not that stupid. They're not that stupid because recently they've been observed, okay? And, and so they like to go into holes and they like to scavenge around, but a possum will not go into a hole if there's only one set of footprints going in. Because they think, ah, oh, smart possum. I'm gonna become roadkill down there because there's something in there, maybe another predator. But a possum will go into a hole if it observes two sets of footprints, one going in and one coming out because he's worked it out, something's gone in and it's come out. It's gonna be okay. And everyone, that is the message of the resurrection. Jesus Christ went into the grave, not with one set of footprints, but there's two sets of footprints. He came out of the grave, and it means that I can go into the grave with no fear, because he's defeated the grave, everyone. And the hope of the Christian faith is, look at me, and this is the really good news, you're dead in your sins, you're gonna die in your flesh, but you can come alive to God, and then when our flesh dies, guess what everyone? One day we're gonna get a brand new body. Come on, come on wife, nudge your husband and say it's good news for you. I saw you this morning in the shower, you really need this message, okay? <laughs> That is the good news that one day, I know you're glad, cancel your gym membership. You're gonna get a new body, okay? <laughs> Number three is this, okay? I live out God's purpose for my life. That's when hope really rises inside of me. For we are God's what? Handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God in his foreknowledge was thinking about you before you were ever born, before, as we say in Ireland, before you were a twinkle in your mother's eye. You never heard that before, had you? Yeah. Oh yeah, there you go. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy, his name is Alfred Nobel. You ever heard of him, Nobel Peace Prize? I've had the privilege with my family of uh, meeting a Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, John Hume. But uh, let me read this to you. He's best known for the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Less well known is the fact that Alfred Nobel also invented dynamite. As well as a chemist, engineer, and innovator, he was a weapons manufacturer. In 1888, and I listen to this carefully, Alfred's brother Ludwig died, and a French newspaper got it all wrong and published Alfred's obituary. They announced that he had died, he was very much alive, it was Ludwig that had gone. It condemned him for his invention of dynamite, stating, the merchant of death is dead, Dr. Alfred Nobel, who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before died yesterday. Alfred Nobel was devastated by the foretaste of how he would be remembered. His last will and testament set aside the bulk of his estate to establish the Nobel Prizes. He gave the equivalent of 250 million US dollars to fund such prizes. Alfred Nobel had the rare opportunity to evaluate his life near its end and live long enough to change that assessment. 
This is what the resurrection does for every single one of us. When you make that living connection with Jesus through his Holy Spirit, listen to me, you get a chance to change your past and have it all forgiven, but also to change your future. And you can't do that by yourself. You've tried to change yourself before and it doesn't work. You've joined the gym, you went on the diet, you tried to stop cussing and it didn't work everybody. Let's be honest, correct? Yes, as soon as you drop something on your toe, you know what came out. <laughs> You've tried to do that before. Here's the message of the resurrection, that Jesus doesn't give you a new start, he makes you a new person. That's what we need. We need to become new people. If it's the old Andrew, it'll be the same old stuff. What I need to do is be joined with Jesus in his death. Lord, just let me completely die, but God, raise me in you with your life inside of me because you know what? I don't need to become a better me. <laughs> I need to forget me and I need to start letting Jesus live through me. And you know what? Suddenly then I discover God's purpose for my life and I have the power to pursue, pursue it. Our last point is this. Isn't it great when the preacher says that? The last point, it's like hope comes into the room. Oh, I pray he's serious. Last point simply is this here. Hope rises is what? When I take the first step. Look at this here. Back to Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, by his sacrifice. We're far away. Far away, but you're brought near. How, how, how does that happen? Well, before living in America, we used to visit sometimes as a family and uh, we got an invitation to spend almost a month in the summer in Atlanta, Georgia. And let's just say in terms of temperature, um, it's a lot different from Ireland. It's kind of like hell. Um, <laughs> And us white Irish turned up and it was just like we're sweating green. We're just sweating green, like just dying the whole time. The humidity, it was just, it was kind of crazy. And then, and then one day, uh, uh, some smart person thought it'd be really good to take us to Six Flags on the hottest day of the year, everyone. And it's not really a theme park. It's more like a human barbecue. That's what it's like, human barbecue. And you know, we were medium rare. You know, it was just, you know, who was, Unbelievable. Anyway, we had a good day as we sweated our God's side. We had a good day. And then uh, around dinner time, we all got hungry and we discovered that the whole park got hungry at that time because we went to the food outlets and I should have brought my passport with me because the line went to Canada, everyone. It just went on forever and ever and ever. And so I said to my wife, why don't you go over there? I saw a little petting zoo, our two youngest ones, take them over there. And, and then we actually found an empty table. It was like, a, a, it was like a, a vision from heaven, an empty table. And I put my second boy, Dan, at the table and I said, guard this table with your life. Here's a plastic fork, fight off those Americans. So he sat at the table, my oldest boy, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll go on the line with you because he's hungry all the time and he wanted to make sure that I would buy enough food, okay? So eventually we got down the line, got the food, tray, we went back to the table. I mean, I didn't get the table wrong. It was the exact table where I'd left Dan and he wasn't there, he wasn't there. And we'd been gone quite a while, he wasn't there. And, and replaced by Dan, let's just say it was a, a large, healthy American family, all right? And I thought, they've eaten the Irish kid. <laughs> they, they didn't want to join the line, so they ate the kid. They had Irish ribs. I mean, what have you done to him? And I went over to Isabel and raised my hand. I said, where's Dan? Where? And we're all panicked, except Ben, our oldest. He's like, who cares more food? And, uh, <laughs> and we're all panicked. And I'm saying, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And suddenly I thought to myself, I handed Isabel the tray and I said, I know where he is, I know where he is. He said, where are you going? I said, just let me go, I know where he is. And I went running, which was a bad idea. It was a bad idea because I was in flip-flops. Have you ever tried to see a middle-aged man running in flip-flops? <laughs> Have you ever tried to see that? It's like, that was like the biggest attraction in the park that day. It was like, everybody was like, ah. 
I'm running through the parks like a Hollywood movie. I'm bouncing people out there. Oh, I don't care if you're a Disney character or whoever. Get out of there. Oh. I'm running and running and running. Parents, you know, you know that feeling, don't you? You know, you know that feeling. I mean, I think he was about eight years old at the time. And I'm like, freaking, oh, where is he? Where is he? But I think I know where he is because, and this is a really good parenting tip. At the beginning of the day, when we walked through the gates and there was all that excitement, we finally got into the park. Everyone wanted to run. I want to go to that roller coaster. I want to go on that ride. I want to get wet. Uh, I said, stay right here for a second. Stay right here. I said, see these three seats over here, right at the end. See these three seats. Ignore that one. Ignore that one. See the middle one. See that middle seat. If you get lost today, come back to this seat. Not that one, not that one. And see if there's like a nice, you know, white-haired granny on that seat. Throw her off. <laughs> Kick her off. But you come to that seat and you sit in that seat. I'm running through the park. I mean, running and running and running. And I just like, was like, oh my goodness. I hope he's there. I came around the band and in the distance I could see someone I didn't know and I got closer and everyone, it was Dan, he sat on the seat, smart kid like his mom. <laughs> he had remembered where to go. And listen, God has left a place for you and for me that if we get lost, and some of us, you know what I'm talking about right now. We get lost in life. We set out with these dreams, these ambitions. We set out with this type of marriage, but it doesn't work out. We want our family to be this, and it all gets a little bit lost, but God said there is a place, and it's right between the cross, and it's right between an empty tomb, and the seat's called hope. And it will always be there for you. And you might say to me, Andrew, I'm far from God. I feel like I'm really far from God. I want to ask you, well, how do you know that? Does anyone have God's zip code? Does anyone know where God lives? You know where God lives? Right here, right now. It's one step. It's one step of the greatest journey the rest of your life. I'm going to ask you, this is really important right now. Okay, some of you are getting itchy, antsy. <laughs> Costco's just opened. I need to get, no, no, please, please, come on. Can I say something? Get a life. All right, um, I'm going to ask you, please, just remain seated. It's going to be okay. This day is going to work out, all right? Just remain seated. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to bow your head. I'm offering you a seat, a seat. Jesus says, come to this place where you find God and find yourself. And if you would like to get right with God today, it's Easter, everybody. You'd like to become a Christian. I don't know, understand all the rules. I don't understand religion. Neither do I, you're okay. But you know you wanna get right with God. Say this prayer with me, just really quickly, simple prayer. Just repeat the words. You can repeat them into yourself. Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for me, for my sins. And I confess I'm a sinner and I repent of those sins and I trust in you. Wash me, cleanse me, make me brand new. Jesus, would you send your Holy Spirit into my life to renew me to give me the power to be a brand new person. And Jesus, would you become the Lord of all of my decisions and my future for the rest of my days?